people here this morning. Great to see all of you, all of you watching online. We welcome you as well. Hey, today is Baptism Sunday, and we rejoice with that. We're going to talk about that, and in the end, for those of you, if that's your next step, we'll explain uh, what we need to do in order to make that happen seamlessly. Hey, there's so much going on. Uh, let's look at some of that right now. In fact, we have the men's breakfast coming up on Saturday. Colorado Praise coming up in a week. And then ATP is Ask the Pastor. What in the world is that, right? After this series, I want to preach one more message in this series next Sunday. Then the week after that, I'll be going into the Ask the Pastor series. And uh, what that's about is I'm taking your questions and I'm building sermons around that. Like, hey, I've always wanted to know or, you know, I've never heard a preacher talk on this or whatever. So send your questions to that email address, greg at theoasisccc.com, and we'll try to get to all of those, if at all possible. So uh, take advantage of that and help me out. Kid Zone, we have some uh, help needed in some of those areas. Check that out too if you'd like to be able to help out and serve in that way. IDS.org is a group uh, that takes care of missionaries need it's international disaster emergency services and we we've worked with i've worked with them for decades and they go around the world when there's emergencies such as in maui and a hundred percent of our donations go directly to uh, helping out people so if that's a passion of yours you can always check that out you can actually get involved you can actually go and be part of the rescue effort teams that they organize there as well too now, as we, as we shift and think about worshiping through giving, I want to put a verse of Scripture, two of them, up on the screen, and it's really at the heart of why we give, and we, we talk about this every week. This is known as the Great Commission. It's the final words of Jesus to his disciples, and it's very, very telling, but I want to read this for you. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to do what? Obey everything I've commanded you. Um, and this is why we give. We give because we are commanded to give. Now, there are some things that we don't understand along the way, or we might hear about, and it's like, oh, I need to investigate that. There's so many commands that God's given to us, but when we follow Jesus' commands, we have the best possible life on this earth. So that's why we give. So thank you for giving. And uh, I pre did y'all hear that booming going on? Is that the kids upstairs or is that Ford Carson? <laughs> I know, I know. So, hey, stand up and greet somebody and say, you picked a great day to be at church. You picked a great day to be at church. You picked a great day to be at church. You picked a great day to be at church. Cute. Oh, isn't that fun? I see some of you, some some of you don't even get up. You're like, if somebody's going to, if I want to say hi to somebody, they got to come to me. And then there's others of you, you're just walking around. This is your time to shine. It's just so much fun. Hey, if you're joining us for the very first time, uh, we are in this in the middle of this message series, Sacred Ceremonies, and we're looking at some of those sacred ceremonies that we do. Why do we do weddings? Why do we do funerals? Why do we take communion? Why do we get baptized? Did we just dream these up and, oh, let's just do these, or did God sanction them? So we're looking into the Bible to see what God says about these sacred ceremonies. In fact, Romans chapter 15 says, for everything that was written in the past was written to what? To... Oh, it's not up there. That's why nobody's reading that with it. To. Yes, somebody had that right to teach us. So that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. In week number one, we looked at why do we do weddings? And we had kind of the theme verse up there, this verse that said in Hebrews 13, that marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge. Um, 
the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. We looked last week at why do we do funerals? Why is that a sacred ceremony? And we read this verse from Ecclesiastes that there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to weep, and a time to laugh. And I've observed over the years that people who mourn appropriately are the same people who are able to return back to life and to laugh more quickly. Today, we're going to talk about why in the world do we do baptisms in church? Why is it a sacred ceremony? You know, I heard the story about there's this guy that walked up on a preacher. He was in the river baptizing like the whole church, and they're there doing baptisms, and the guy just got in line, and the preacher turned him around. It was his turn. Obviously, the man was inebriated. And he said, are you ready to find Jesus? And he said, yeah. And he dunked him and pulled him up, and he said, brother, did you find Jesus? He said, no. So he dunked him again. He said, my brother, did you find Jesus? He said, no. He dunked him a third time and held him under a really long time. His feet are kicking, his hands are flailing. He raises him up for the, for the love of God. Did you find Jesus? And the drunk looks at him and goes, are you sure this is where he fell in? Oh, you guys are kind today. It's a preacher joke. Uh, today, if you're ready to find Jesus, I, I really, I promise you, you're going to find him. And in Jesus' final instructions that I just read for our giving time, I want us to read uh, these scriptures together. Again, this is the uh, Great Commission, the final words that Jesus gives. Read those with me, will you? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, Matthew 28, 19, and 20. you got to remember the address, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Have you, have you ever wondered, why did Jesus command baptism? I mean, why did he command this unusual thing? Why didn't he just say, hey, go and make disciples and having them memorize my genealogy? Or go make disciples and have them go visit the Holy Land? Why is it that he wanted us to be immersed totally under the water? It's an unusual kind of practice. And the truth is, baptism has been disputed over the years since the Bible was actually written. About a thousand years ago, we call it the Dark Ages. Uh, baptism, it's like if you got baptized, you were instantly a Christian. And like, like a Jewish boy, when he's circumcised, you're, you're a Hebrew, you're a Jewish follower. And uh, so uh, they started baptizing infants. And uh, just so, hey, now they're a Christian. Now you're saved. And uh, so the, the Reformers came about about 500 years later, the Protestant Reformers. And they disputed that. They're like, no, that's not the way it is at all. And if you're going to become a Christian, you need to make that decision on your own. So you need to be old enough to be able to understand the Scriptures. Uh, I mean, you can get soaked all you want in the water, but if, all, if you don't believe with your heart, well, all you're going to be is a wet sinner, that they thought. So they, the pendulum actually swung all the way up here, all the way over to here, when they said baptism has nothing to do with salvation at all. It's just an, uh, an outward practice of an inward faith. And so... The Bible illustrates, however, over and over and over and over again that baptism is very, very significant, and we should obey Jesus' command to be baptized. So God has a reason behind every command. When, when God told Noah, build an ark, it wasn't just so he would obey God out of obedience. It ended up being a means of his survival. When God said, don't eat certain foods, when he said, don't intermarry with close relatives, when he said, take one day off and seven, well, they weren't just to obey out of an expression of faith, but that ended up being the best life possible if you followed his commands. First John 5 says this, this is love for God to obey what? To obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. So his commandments are not meaningless Duty. So today, I'm going to try to attempt to preach the simplest message about why God commands us to be baptized and why it is that baptism is a sacred ceremony. 
So in baptism, if you if you have your outline, we have on our church app. You can download our app, our, our outline, and fill that out. There's a discussion guide. Take that through the week. Use that with your family. Use that with your small group. But God meets our deepest emotional, psychological, and spiritual needs in baptism. What are those needs? If you're taking notes, number one, baptism meets our need for an expression of faith, for an expression of faith. God's created us in such a way that almost every emotion has an appropriate outlet. We release sadness by crying, fear with a scream, gratitude by giving, love with an impassioned embrace. Jesus taught us with the cleansing of the temple that there's an appropriate outlet for anger as well. When we uh, are excited, we, we laugh. Uh, but when you suppress your emotions, and ex- it's kind of like when you try to sneeze and you hold that in, it hurts inside. That's the way that it is. William James, the founder of modern psychology, said this, an impression without an expression leads to depression. An impression without an expression leads to depression. I watched this past week the GOP uh, debates, and, and one of the guys up on the stage said that he joined the military after September 11, 2001, and he went to Iraq. And I think by, I saw the Twin Towers fall, and like many Americans, when that happened in 2001, what did we do? We were angry. Uh, we empathized with all of those who died. We wanted to do something, so we flew flags. We prayed. Uh, we watched the news. Why? Because we felt a need to do something to express what we felt. So I think that's why Jesus so often had people do things in association with healing. Um, uh, he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam, and you'll be healed. Stretch forth your withered hand. Go show yourself to the priest." and then you will be cleansed. He could have healed these people automatically, but he had them express their faith through this action. And so what do you do when you're impressed with Jesus? When you finally get it, he died for my sins. He's the Savior of the world. He was buried. He was raised again. We have hope in this life and hope in the next. He's created you on purpose with a purpose and for a purpose. And when we hear that and grasp that for the first time, what do we do with that impression? Well, baptism is provided by God as a means of expression. Now, in Acts chapter 2, the New Testament book of Acts, it is a history of the church. In chapter 2, we have the very, very first gospel message preached by Peter, and we're going to read through that and see how people were impressed. This is the first time that God brought it together into a sermon, and Peter's preaching it. And in Acts chapter 2, we read that Peter stood up and said, Listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. He goes on, And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead. And we are all witnesses of that fact. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And the people were impressed. Look at what they said. When the people heard this, they were what? They were cut to the heart and and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Now, what was Peter's response? Did he say, well, there's nothing you can do. God's going to draw you and invite you. No, he didn't say that. Did did Peter say, raise your hand if you agree with this message? He didn't say that. Did Peter say, bow your heads and pray this simple prayer of faith and you'll be saved? No, he didn't say that. Look at what he said. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So God ordained baptism, this sacred ceremony, as a condition of salvation that sufficiently meets our need for a meaningful expression of our faith. I've baptized so many people over the years, and I never had somebody come up out of the water, and they say, well, what else do I need to do to accept Christ? They've never said that, because baptism meets that need. It's a natural expression when you're impressed 
with what Christ has done for us. Number two, baptism also meets the need for cleansing of sin. When we sin, we should feel like bad inside. We call it a guilty conscience. In Jesus, he talked about murder, adultery, sexual morality, theft, lying, slander, all make a person unclean. He said, the book of James, we read about it in the New Testament. He talks about being polluted by the world and how to get rid of the moral filth in our lives. So when we do wrong, we should naturally feel like something's wrong inside. In fact, if you don't feel that twins in your conscience, well, you might have a hardened conscience or a seared conscience, the Bible says, because you've been repeating sin so much you're not even affected by it. And it, you're reflected uh, of what First Timothy says in chapter 4, those whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. But if you have a good conscience, you're going to feel guilty inside. And you'll yearn to have, I want to have a pure heart. I want to have a clean heart. In fact, David in the Old Testament, King David, he wanted to have a pure heart. He had committed a sin, adultery with Bathsheba. He murdered her husband to cover it over. He lied about it, but he came to a level of repentance when he yearned to have a clean heart. And we read about his expression of faith here in Psalm uh, 51. He cried out, have mercy on me, O God. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. We should have that guilt before us. He needed his conscience renewed. And he says, wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Create in me a pure heart. Oh, God, and no matter how hard you try, you can't erase your past. You can't forgive your own sins. Only one can do that. The only way that you can have your sins forgiven is by the blood of Jesus. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 9, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. You see, we fight fire with fire. And God fought death with death, the death of his one and only son. In fact, we, how many of you like hymns? Hymns, raise your hand. And if you don't know what a hymn is, you young people, you can Google that. We, we used to have a hymnal, and we sang this hymn. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, no, we're not going to finish that. Event. <laughs> but when, when we believe in the power of Jesus, we admit, you know what? I'm powerless to forgive my own sin. I need the blood of Jesus to make me whole again. And baptism is the most wonderful and refreshing symbol of that. Look at how First Peter, how Peter sums it up in his epistle. He said, this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a what? A good conscience, a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus. Peter's saying it's not the outer washing that cleanses you, but it's that inner cleansing by the blood of Jesus. And I, I think God prescribed immersion in water just because of how it represents the cleansing from head to toe, even though it is internal. If, if you watched the old movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? and thought that was cool, you're weird like me, I think. I wouldn't recommend that movie for, even though it's PG-13, for, for any child. But there is this baptism scene that is so realistic. Delmar is one of three convicts that walks upon a preacher baptizing the church into Jesus Christ, and his experience, I think, illustrates the, the reality of baptism. So check out this clip. Come on down, come on brothers, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the star?
Come on, mothers, let's go down. Well, I guess hard times flush the chump. Everybody's looking for answers. So is How's he going? Mark been saved. Well, that's it, boys. I've been redeemed. The preacher done washed away all my sins and transgressions. It's a straight and narrow from here on out. And heaven everlasting's my reward. Delver, what are you talking about? We got bigger fish to fry. The preacher said all my sins is washed away, including that piggly wiggly I knocked over in Yazoo. I thought you said you was innocent of those charges. Well, I was lying. And the preacher said that that sin's been washed away, too. Neither God nor man's got nothing on me now. Come on in, boys. The water is fine. <sighs> Delmar got it right. I mean, what a wonderful sense of cleansing and renewal when you know your past is forgiven and you've got a new start. In fact, Ananias told Saul of Tarsus this, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, by, or wash your sins away, in Del Mar's voice, by calling on the name of the Lord. You see, God commanded baptism as it meets our need for an expression of faith, and it meets our need for the forgiveness of sins. Number three, baptism also meets our need for a benchmark of commitment. Um, we have different benchmarks in life. Uh, there are all kinds of benchmarks that serve as important points. For example, your birth date is a benchmark. Uh, now, your life actually began at, at conception, but you mark, you mark your birthday as the day that you entered this world. Your wedding date, well, that wasn't the date that you fell in love. That wasn't the date that you made a commitment. But that wedding date is a benchmark because that is when the two became one. So it's a benchmark that... Men, you better remember every year when that date rolls around, okay? Uh, but baptism is a benchmark that something significant, some significant transformation has taken place. Um, in Romans chapter 6, it's a passage that I used to read all the time during baptisms. I want to read it for you right now. Incredible expression here, and uh, starting with verse 3. Don't you all know that those of us who are what? baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death. So Paul uses this imagery all throughout Scripture, this death, burial, and resurrection. In fact, elsewhere in the New Testament, if you read being raised in Christ, uh, being buried in Christ, even though the word might, baptism might not even be found, they're referring to baptism in those passages. He goes on, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. It goes on, if we have been united with him in his death, we will certainly be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. I mean, you, you could have gone to church all of your life and believed all of your life but baptism is that line of demarcation that something significant has happened um, in fact i read an article in the christian standard the christian standard is a publication of our churches uh, we have them available for free out there on the wall you can take one of those every month a new one comes out and you can learn about theology you can learn uh, about information. There's different articles written. Well, a friend of mine, a classmate, wrote this article about baptism, and I want to put it up on the screen just so you can see the words as I read. But he wrote this. When a person dies, what do we do? We have a funeral. We say a few words with the body as friends gather. We put the body in a hearse, drive it to the graveyard where we have a burial, and it's over. He goes on and says, baptism is much the same thing. We take a person who's dead in their sins and we bury them. And he goes on and says, Yet some people say that baptism is for the person who's already saved, 
but who would bury a living person? So baptism is that benchmark of spiritual transformation. Now, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, uh, in the Gospel of John, Jesus has a conversation with Nicodemus. And he's talking about the spiritual transformation. You've ever heard the term born again? This is where it came from. And uh, Jesus said, unless a man be born again, he tells Nicodemus, he can't see the kingdom of God. And he's like, what are you talking about, Jesus? And he says, how can a man be born when he's old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you that no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and born of the spirit. No matter how old you are, you can be born again. I've baptized 10-year-olds. I've baptized 80-year-olds. And uh, after that, you have new life in that born-again experience. Baptism is when we can say you're a Christian. Often when people are baptized, they come up, I say, you're now Christian. You're now Christian. Like you might say to somebody who just got married, you're married now. And in fact, uh, Jesus told his disciples this. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. This is in Mark's gospel. This is the Great Commission there in Mark's gospel as well. He says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. So when we follow God's commands, they're not burdensome. And we follow the conditions. We repent of our sins. We're baptized into Christ. We call on his name. That is a benchmark of obedience. And we have the assurance of salvation, the Bible calls it. Now, I think this is especially true for everybody, but maybe those who grew up in the church who didn't have like a dramatic experience. This benchmark is so significant. Like when I came to Christ when I was 20, I didn't go to church. So when I was baptized into Christ, there was a big difference between the before and after experience. But if you grew up in church and you're asked, hey, when did Christ become real to you? You might say, well, he's always been real because you grew up in church. It'd be like saying, when did your parents first become real to you? Well, they've always been there, so they've always been real. But when you're baptized into Christ, you can say, this is the date. This is when transformation took place. It's my born-again date. So baptism is, isn't just a reference point for ourselves, but it's a benchmark for others that we do that. People see it, and we go, that's when God changed me. You can see now that I'm going to be different, which my friends really understood the before and after difference. Now I belong to Christ. Well, number four, there's another human need that God meets in baptism, and that is for the humbling of our spirit. The humbling of our spirit. You know what? I think the biggest single barrier that's between man and God, you know what it is? I don't think it's lust. I don't think it's greed. I don't think it's doubt. It's pride. It's pride. Over and over, Scripture tells us about this difficulty. And we read about it in Proverbs 16. The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this. They will not go unpunished. And in our intellectual pride, we want to discover truth on our own. But we can't. We humbly come to God and say, God, we're going to believe in your truth. I want to believe what you have told us. That's our intellectual pride. Our social pride wants to associate with impressive people. But Jesus associated with sinners and the common man, the selfish pride we have. We want to just earn salvation on our own. Oh, like the little child who says, I can do that. But no, we humble ourselves and say, God, I can't do it on my own. Proverbs 18 says, before his downfall, a man's heart is what? Proud. But humility, humility comes before honor. I used to cut my nephew's hair uh, years ago, but I remember this like it was yesterday. There was one day I was at my sister's house. Jonathan was seven. She said, hey, go upstairs and change your shirt so we could get hair all over a different shirt. And I he just said that. And my sister said, go up and change. you got to get a haircut. He said, I don't want to do that. There's some type of pride that wells up in all of us. that We don't want somebody telling us what to do. And it's passed down from generation to generation to generation through their mothers. 
just kidding, just kidding. But pride goes down hard. I tell my nephew, I said, go up and change your shirt. we got to cut your hair. He went up. He didn't like it. Now, I love my nephew. My sister loves her son. But which attitude is much more easier, the easiest to love? When he's rebelling or when he has a humble spirit? Well, it's when he has that humble spirit. First Peter 5 says, God opposes the proud. You don't want God to oppose you. Let me just tell you that. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. The Bible makes it clear that we've got to come to God humbly and admit, I'm a sinner, God. I'm a sinner. I think that's one of the primary reasons why God instituted this sacred ceremony of baptism, because it's a pride eliminator. I've seen all kinds of people come forward to be baptized, and none of them has been proud. I've seen those come to the baptistry to come forward. They're dressed to the nines. They've got this expensive big old hairdo. But when they come to the baptistry, they're all like dressed alike, and that expensive hairdo is in trouble. I'm telling you that. The baptism is a humbling act, but it's not a humiliating one. It's a beautiful picture of that death, burial, and resurrection. And you leave the old life behind and you're raised up in newness of life, a new creation, the Bible says. In Acts chapter 8, there's a story of this Ethiopian treasurer, an official in the cabinet of Ethiopia. They'd just been, he'd just been to Jerusalem to worship. He'd heard evidently that the Messiah had come. And so he was intrigued by this. So on his way home on his chariot, he was reading some of the Old Testament prophecies prophecies about the Messiah. And he's reading this particular one from from Acts chapter 8, verse 32. And it's quoting um, one of the Old Testament predictions that he was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. God sent Philip, a preacher of the gospel, to come alongside that chariot. And he said, hey, what are you reading? He said, I don't know. Can you explain this to me? And he came up into the chariot, and the Ethiopian said, tell me, please, who is this prophet talking about himself or somebody else? And so Peter, or so Philip said similar words to what we read that Peter would have said. He laid out the gospel story, and we know that it's similar, even though we don't know the details here in Acts chapter 8 of what he said, but he shared the gospel because of the man's impression, because of the Ethiopian treasure's response. And it says this in verse 36, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And the Bible says that they commanded the chariot to stop and fill up And the eunuch went down into the water. He baptized them. He came up out of the water. And they went on their way rejoicing. Baptism was just a natural expression of the faith in Jesus. I need Jesus to be my Savior. It was a pledge of a good conscience. It's the benchmark of significant transformation. It's humbly yielding to Jesus, obeying, simply obeying his commands. 1 John 5, again, this is love for God, to obey his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. So I pray today, if you've never been baptized, that that simple message of the gospel, that maybe you're hearing it very, very clearly for the first time, and you're going to make that decision. So I would encourage you today, in the heart and words of Acts 22, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away by calling on the name of the Lord. And that's why baptism is a sacred ceremony. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to pray in just a moment. If God has made an impression upon you and you've never been baptized, you're like, you know what, I understand it now. This is what you're going to do. When I'm praying, after we pray, we're going to sing. When we stand to sing, Make your way to the lobby. We have a baptism team there. So mind you, if you're just going to use the bathroom or leave, they may get you changed and into the baptistry. Just want you to know, so be careful with that. But make your way out there. You'll change. 
We have everything that you need, towels, whatever, blow dryers and everything when you get out. Have everything that you need. We're going to videotape it. So you get changed and you just file back in here. We're going to have you fill out a card. And after you change after your baptism, I want to meet you upstairs just to say a few words. We'll get your card. We'll talk with you for a minute. And that's how it's going to happen. So would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for sacred ceremonies. Oh, I thank you for the beautiful expression of baptism that you've commanded each of us to follow. I thank you for Jesus, that you sent your one and only Son, and how that's so intricate to the gospel message. And, oh, I just pray that we would just have that cut to our hearts to say, what should we do? And that you meet those deepest needs in baptism. And it's as simple as that. What a, a simple and beautiful expression. Thank you for that. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus being baptized. Thank you for allowing that blood to come into contact with us in baptism. Thank you so much. I thank you for those who are being baptized today to have that life transformation to take place in their lives. And, oh, we just thank you and pray this in Jesus' holy name. And everybody who agreed said amen and amen.